I wanted to talk a little bit about science. This is sort of a generic word that people throw around all the time, but no one really has any idea what it is when they use it. Uh, and a lot of times when you think of science, you think of facts, figures, equations, um, just a big nebulous pool of data somewhere out there in the ether. But what science actually is, is a verb. Science is the process of expanding our body of knowledge. Now, that process has evolved over time. It started out eh, a little bit superstitious, uh, but now modern science has evolved into a very specific process. Science tends to answer the question how, not the question why. An example I like is that uh, science will tell you how to clone a T-Rex, the humanities will tell you why that's a terrible idea. So, why do we pursue science? Well, we pursue science for a lot of different reasons. We pursue it for understanding, we pursue it for innovation, we pursue it for repeatability and perspective, to give ourselves a new perspective on the world around us. Uh, a lot of times, if you have something good happen, you want it to be repeated. Uh, the early examples of this would be agriculture. You grow a lot of crops, they yield, they yield a lot of food. You want to repeat that from year to year, so you find out what you did right. Now, initially, that was developed as a natural philosophy, that superstitious way of thinking of things. We did something right, the gods were pleased, and so we uh, want to keep doing that. Uh, whether that something right was uh, singing the right song, dancing the right dance, sacrificing the right goat, I don't know. But they wanted to keep doing that. Eventually, that started, uh, that started evolving into a modern science. Because from those, they began to observe. Once agriculture started taking off, a lot of people could specialize and they could observe what was going on in the world when they planted crops, when they harvested crops, when they found that they yielded a lot of food, when they found that they found that they yielded a little food. So that natural philosophy turned into an actual uh, method of observation. And this dates back to thousands of years uh, into Mesopotamia, it dates back into uh, Asian culture. Uh, the uh, Chinese were the first to develop seismology, uh, rockets, the wheelbarrow, the parachute, suspension bridge, all sorts of things. Uh, and you have other, other cultures, like the Babylonians. They made uh, huge leaps in astronomical observations. Egyptians made uh, huge contributions in the medical field and, uh, and um, mathematics. Um, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of sciences were advanced from cultures all around the world. And they've culminated into what we know as modern science. Now in modern science, uh, we've removed a lot of the mysticism. A lot of uh, assumptions are made about our universe in modern science. For example, our universe is real. You're not the product of someone else's dream. If someone else wakes up, you're not going to disappear. We can observe our universe, and it's consistent. Our universe is consistent and has regular behavior, and it's repeatable behavior. Uh, it's also reasonable. You can understand it. It's logical and orderly, and you can understand it by using reason and observation. These are the assumptions that we make about our universe to better understand it and to better categorize uh, different things that we observe. This allows us to develop a method for studying science, for making observations, and a method for understanding our universe. This is what we call the scientific method, and it breaks down into five parts. Uh, the first thing you do is question. You make some question about your universe. It can be very broad, it can be very, very specific, but some question needs to be answered. After you ask this question, you make a hypothesis. A hypothesis is generally an educated guess. This is a testable explanation uh, that's generally an educated guess and can be verified or falsified. The third step in the scientific method is prediction. From your hypothesis, from your educated guess, if you were to test that guess, what do you think would happen? If you were to test it under certain conditions, what do you think the outcome would be? So, you set out to experiment. Experimentation is the next step in the scientific method. You experiment to find out if you're right. And this experiment includes collecting data and making observations of that data. Now, this isn't always done in a lab. You can observe things in the natural world. You can go into a lab and set up lab conditions to experiment. Um, you can experiment through simulation. There are all sorts of ways to set up these experiments, but what those experiments do is they're developed to test some sort of hypothesis. And through these observations, 
we can develop some sort of conclusion. Now that conclusion isn't always great. It might not always be what we want it to be. But that conclusion is developed based on what we observe through experimentation. So through our conclusion, we can tell whether our hypothesis was correct or false. Now, if our hypothesis was false, that doesn't mean we're out of the game. If our hypothesis was false, we just go back to the drawing board and we revise our hypothesis. If our hypothesis is false, we try and use what we learn through experimentation to come up with a new hypothesis, to develop something that is a little closer to the truth. Uh, and then we go through experimentation again, we, get, we develop conclusions, and ultimately, eventually, we're going to arrive at conclusions that are correct. We're going to find that our hypothesis is verified as we adapt that hypothesis to what our observations show. Now, if that hypothesis is tested again and again and again, and we find that over, over repeated experimentation that we conclude that it's correct under various circumstances, under every, in, uh, under every experiment we've run, this hypothesis holds true then it becomes what we call a theory. Now this is a really important point because a lot of people will mix these two things up. A lot of people refer to hypothesis as theories. So don't be confused. A theory is a well-tested, well-supported hypothesis. So if something is just a theory, that means that it's undergone a lot of scrutiny and holds up pretty well. Now, if that theory continues to hold up pretty well and we find it to be essentially universally true, then it becomes a law. So that's our, hypo that's our scientific method. Now, <clears throat> what does it mean to think scientifically? Uh, thinking scientifically doesn't mean that you read a few books and you know a lot about that thing. Uh, a lot of times science and scientific thinking starts by not knowing. So we set out to find out. That's scientific thinking. A blog is not a scientific, a scientific resource. Uh, a book is not a scientific resource. Anyone can write a book. The fundamental foundation of scientific inquiry is doubt, followed by investigation. So there are a bunch of random facts. And if you're following along with PowerPoint, there are a bunch of random facts that I've put on here. Um, for example, Algae creates 95% of the world's oxygen. Um, it is impossible to fold a piece of paper more than nine times. Water actually contains calories, but they are removed during the treatment process. A lot of these facts we see on the internet may or may not be true. And the ones I just read, you don't know. They could be true, they could be false. I mean, inherently you might know, but how do you really know? without investigating. If you take me at my word, then you might go along thinking that the barracuda is a domesticated fish. Now some of these can be verified and some can't, but the only way that you know is if you investigate them. Now, there's a big difference between good science and bad science, and this is where a lot of people get confused. Good science comes with four characteristics. Good science is provisional, meaning that it changes, meaning that what we think one day might be completely proven false the next day. Take plate tectonics, for example. Prior to 1963, plate tectonics was non-existent. No one knew how the continents became the way they were until 1963 when plate tectonics was supported. This meant that all the textbooks on the Earth and Earth's structure and Earth's processes had to be changed. So science changed almost overnight. So ch science is provisional. It's changing. Science is also testable, meaning that you can test it. So that means that you can't base a scientific principle on what someone saw the other day and they totally heard their friend say that they saw another friend, saw, saw their cousin do it, and so it must be true. Science is testable you have to be able to perform some sort of test to verify whether or not it's true. Science is also reproducible, meaning that if I take good notes on the experiment that I run and I hand those notes over to someone else and they repeat the experiment exactly as I did, they should get the same results. Now, those results might vary t a tiny bit and that's why you, we usually involve statistics to analyze our conclusion, but 
that science that means that it's repeatable and finally science is natural science doesn't rely on some uh, some deus ex machina science doesn't rely on a supernatural explanation I like to use the Harry Potter example um, anything that needs to be solved can and will be solved by a wand in Harry Potter now in science you can't use magic as a go-to response. You can't use a magic wand to say, to explain something. Science has to be a natural, a natural phenomenon. Now some phenomenon might be really, really weird. And what I think people forget sometimes is that nature is weird. The earth and the universe do some really weird things sometimes. So those are the pro, those are the Four characteristics of good science. Now there are also characteristics of bad science and you can really identify bad science based on these four characteristics. If that science attacks another scientist, um, well I think that scientist is stupid and so they're wrong. Then that's not really valid science. That's, that's science with an agenda. Um, arguing from authority. You see this a lot in politics. Um, I'm your mother because I said so. That's arguing from authority and uh, bad statistics a lot of times that arguing from authority leads to bad statistics and and what you do in those cases is you gotta kind of be aware of who signs the paychecks sometimes those people that are trying to nudge someone in the right direction uh, can alter statistics and ultimately you get bad statistics and you can't rely on them also a characteristic of bad science now, one of the biggest characteristics of bad science that I see all the time is causality versus correlation. Now, this is a big one because causality doesn't mean the same thing as correlation. And the example I like to use is ice cream cones at the beach. If I say, the more people that go to the beach, the more we see ice cream cone sales rise, I would like to conclude that if you buy ice cream, you're going to go to the beach. Now, who in their right mind would believe that? I just had ice cream a few minutes ago, and I don't feel like going to the beach. No, what we intuitively know is that if you're at the beach, obviously it's hot, and you're probably going to want something cold, and so you're probably going to buy some ice cream. Now, that doesn't mean that one causes the other. And this is the danger in analyzing numbers and analyzing statistics is that a lot of people like to say one will cause the other. And that's a big characteristic of bad science when someone tries to say uh, that one thing causes another thing. So those are characteristics of good science versus characteristics of bad science. And there are exemptions to every one of these, uh, to the scientific method. There are exemptions to the scientific method. Uh, a lot of times in geology, what we see is that the experiment has already been run and we can see the results and we can see the uh, the data and we can we can observe what came out of the experiment but the question that we have is what were the conditions of that experiment so a lot of times in geology what you see is that we sort of take that scientific method and work backwards through it um, that's not to say that it invalidates it but we have to use it in a different way um, <clears throat> so that is the uh, scientific method. Use it wisely.